This right here is probably one of the strangest pieces of computer hardware that I own. It looks kind of like a graphics card, it has a fan duct tape to the end of it, and it gets its power from an 8-pin PCIe power connector. It's not until you look just a little bit closer and notice the full complement of USB ports, display port, ethernet, and an internal NVMe slot that you realize this thing just looks like an ordinary PC. But dig inside just a little bit further and there's nothing very ordinary about it at all. As it turns out, under this heatsink lies the exact same silicon as you would find in a regular launch model PlayStation 5, complete with 16GB of GDDR6 memory, and as far as I know, I'm the only one that's been able to play games on it using modern Linux. And the story behind why this thing exists, and why you can buy them for basically nothing right now, is nothing short of fascinating. You see, AMD makes a lot of CPUs and SoCs, and you're probably aware that Sony is a pretty large customer of theirs. The problem is, yields aren't always perfect when you're manufacturing millions of chips a year, and some of these CPUs that are made for the console manufacturers just don't work properly. Some of them have bad CPU cores that can lock up when running code, or they might have broken GPUs, so they're no good for playing games. And any of these chips that end up having too many defects are basically worthless, because Sony isn't going to start selling PS5s with broken CPU cores. Now, if only there was a group of people buying up just about every single GPU on the market that we could sell these otherwise worthless APUs to, is what ASRock said when they apparently saw the conundrum AMD had been caught up in, and in turn, the two companies made this beautiful piece of engineering, the AMD BC250 Bitcoin Mining Rack. And just one of these racks contains a total of 12 BC250 blades, with each blade holding the PS5 SoC and 16GB of RAM, as I mentioned earlier, with a couple of compromises. The biggest of which is the fact that two CPU cores have been disabled per blade, leaving us with six CPU cores and 12 threads, and out of the 32 GPU compute units on the die, only 24 of them are enabled, which scales down performance by quite a bit. Windows won't boot properly on it, and pretty much every Linux distribution you try to run will either fall back to software rendering, or just lock up the entire system during boot, so you can't really do much with these blades out of the box. But Finally, after a few months of having this thing to sit on my desk, I came across a post on Reddit where a user had claimed to have this GPU working with games inside a Linux distro by downgrading to an older Linux kernel which saw the built-in GPU as a regular Navi 10 device. This discovery was followed by several nearly sleepless nights in a Discord group chat experimenting with every single other outdated Linux ISO I could find, and ultimately attempts to bisect the AMD GPU driver to find whatever change broke the GPU's functionality in newer kernel versions. To make a long story short, we ended up making a patch to revert a change in the graphics driver that completely broke the PS5 APU in kernel version 6.5, meaning we could finally use a slightly newer Linux LTS 6.6 .6 kernel, along with a patch version of the Mesa package, which is the library that provides implementations of graphics APIs like Vulkan and OpenGL. So if you're savvy with Arch Linux, we have all of our package builds with the patches we made on the AUR, so make a search for BC250 and you can build those if you have a blade to test with. And with all that finally figured out, I had a pretty cursed blade-shaped PS5 computer running Linux, and we even went through the effort to install a GameScope session, so at the risk of sounding like clickbait, I guess I turned my PS5 into a Steam Deck, but what I really want to do here is try to figure out how far we can push this hardware to see what exactly a PS5 is theoretically capable of. The very first test I ran on here was actually Minecraft, and it ran perfectly fine. In a single player survival world, I was getting nearly 300 frames per second average at 1440p once I had generated a few chunks, but in all honesty, that's not super interesting. Minecraft can run on just about anything these days. Before I went any further, I decided to run a Passmark CPU mark test for Linux to try to get a feel for what kind of desktop hardware might be comparable, and given this is a Zen 2 CPU with 6 CPU cores, the multi-core score of 13,800 puts it right in line with a Ryzen 5 2600X, which I guess isn't really all that impressive, and the added memory latency caused by the use of GDDR6 on the CPU side doesn't really help, but given I have 12 of these sitting in a metal box, it's not all too bad. Either way, next I wanted to get into emulation. Naturally, in order to live up to the title of this video, I needed to show something related to PS3, so I went ahead and grabbed a copy of RPCS3. 
The rationale here is that in the past, Sony and therefore many self-proclaimed experts have stated that PS3 emulation is simply not possible on the PS5, as it's just too computationally expensive. And obviously that's just corpo speak for we can't make money if you don't buy new games, but I need an excuse to show this off anyway. Gran Turismo 5 Prologue is hands down my favorite entry in the Gran Turismo series, and I've tested it quite a few times over the years on RPCS3, so I have to admit, watching it run this well is just a testament to the incredible amount of effort that has been put into improving this emulator. Everything ran fine at 60 frames a second, with only the occasional shader glitch here and there, but it was a lot better than I expected, and just for fun I cranked up the resolution to 1440p, which still maintained somewhat playable frame rates. One thing I noticed at this point was that for whatever reason, the AMD GPU driver only sees a single memory clock state that can be applied to this GPU, which is a measly 400 megahertz. And since the memory clock isn't scaling under load, but the core clock is, I'm gonna assume that this is some kind of hard-coded BIOS limitation, and we're probably leaving a lot of performance on the table. Performance that I unfortunately do not know how to get. So I tested some GPU benchmarks, and we were really only seeing numbers comparable to an RX 480, which is a far cry from the RX 6700 that the PS5 SoC supposedly shares a lot in common with. 4K optimized, 980, for RX 480, GTX 1060. I'm not sure if there are any good ways of improving this, but ironically, it proves that even a severely impaired PS5 can also run PS3 games. Little Big Planet 2 was another really fun test, and in most levels, we could get stable frame rates while running at 4K, or worst case scenario, 1440p, with FSR upscaling in more demanding levels. This is a better experience than PS4 backwards compatibility ever gave for Little Big Planet on the PS5, which is really kind of sad. Even Watch Dogs ran just as bad in the emulator as it does on a real PS3. Obviously, this doesn't make hardly any sense since there's a superior PC port of the game, but if you want, you can play Watch Dogs on an underclocked PS5 with inferior graphics and a few nice added bugs. Again, I think this just says more about the optimization that's gone into RPCS3, because running a big open world game like this is anything but easy. Aside from emulation, I tested a lot more games, and there's definitely a lot to talk about with this hardware. One of the more interesting things I ran into was basically any Unity game where lighting could be anywhere from slightly off to absolutely mangled, and I don't know why this is the case. Maybe the drivers are regressing, since support for this GPU was officially removed from the AMD GPU driver, but it's safe to say that not all games are perfectly playable here. There were even some graphical glitches in the Steam Deck interface, and not to mention, since we needed to patch our own build of Mesa, any Flatpak application that includes Mesa just won't detect the GPU at all. It'll all fall back to software rendering, which makes it a little more difficult to find apps to run on here. But the goal here was never to figure out whether or not buying something like this makes any sense, because obviously it doesn't, unless you can find some kind of a rational use case for this hardware, and that's easier said than done. These are server blades, and they generate a ton of heat, so in order to even get them running, you have to add a loud fan, and then maintain the software to actually run the code. So then, why did I buy 12 more of them? I don't really know, but they didn't cost a whole lot, and knowing that it's possible to get the GPUs doing actual work in these cards, even if they can't run as fast as we might want them to, I think it's still a fascinating testbed for experimenting. For example, you can run Stable Diffusion on Vulkan Compute Shaders and have that going in parallel across 12 nodes, which definitely sounds fun. Other than that, I don't think you should buy the AMD BC250. It doesn't make a lot of sense once you realize how much work is needed to make even a single blade useful. But again, that wasn't the point, I just thought it was really cool, and we definitely got to learn a lot about this hardware that would otherwise be sitting unused. So. Let me know if you thought this was interesting, or maybe if you have a better idea on what to use these things for, because I'd love to hear your thoughts. I hope you enjoyed the video, thanks for watching, and as always, have a good one.